start actually. Okay, so uh, great pleasure to have Fuad uh, back with us again. So um, for his second lecture on choice models. So um, Fuad, uh, we can start. Okay, thank you very much. Again, it is a great pleasure to be with you. And so today I will talk uh, in the pre at the end of the previous lecture, I gave uh, the very idea of um, violation of the classic utility models. Uh, I mean, and most important thing is that uh, the uh, indifference relation might not be transitive. We studied, uh, we analyzed with you this um, cases with radiocarbon uh, dating of artifacts, for instance, uh, this example with sugar and coffee, example with horse, pony and bicycle, etc. And so today I will talk about a bit different direction. In fact, uh, two directions in uh, choice theory, uh, how individual choice theory is developing. Uh, so, and the first thing is the following. In this very model concerning uh, radiocarbon uh, dating, uh, you remember I told you that uh, this very evaluation is not exact. So radiocarbon method gives us not exact date, for instance, 5,000 years ago, but 5,000 plus minus 500 or 3,000 plus minus 200, etc. And this was a uh, this very problem was stated by great mathematician Bertrand Russell to very young guy who came to Cambridge University, being uh, 14 years old for PhD program, and this young guy was Norbert Wiener, the father of cybernetics, and Wiener. Uh, resolved this problem in his uh, PhD dissertation. He has uh, three articles in uh, written in 1914, as far as I remember, 1919 and 1921, I think. Uh, and uh, what was the idea? Look here. Instead of give, uh, is it? Uh, Instead of giving exact um, uh, evaluation u of x to x, our utility, yes, he suggested to formalize it as follows. We have an interval which is prescribed to x, to the alternative x. Again, we have a finite uh, set of alternatives, x is alternative from this set, and we prescribe instead of the exact number u of x, some interval, u of x, u of x are plus epsilon. And then we might make this comparison as before, you remember, here it had to be zero, u of x greater than u of y, we say that x is more preferable than y, if u of x is greater than u of y, now she suggested to use here this very error or insensitivity of comparison, okay? And then again, the question arises, what kind of properties should satisfy this p here for this holds, for this relation, for this equivalency holds? And there are several models of threshold. I call this epsilon as a threshold function. Um, and there are several models. And uh, one model is, uh, in fact, it was considered later on. Uh, it, in, it was first time it was considered in the article by Richard Duncan Lewis, very famous, very great scientist whose books like games and decisions influenced uh, enormously scientific community. Mm, yeah, 
in his article, as far as I remember, it was 1956, he considered the case epsilon constant and greater than zero. And there were several, condi oops, several conditions. And the first one is strong intervality condition. In fact, in classic literature, it is called intervality condition. And I added here strong because later on we will see what is a weak intervality condition. And uh, it, it is uh, written as follows. You see, if I have this uh, X is better than Y and Z is better than W, then it should be at least one of these preferences. Either X is better than W or Z is better than Y. Semi-transitivity condition. You remember the uh, condition of um, negative transitivity, what it was. If X is better than Y for any W, either X is better than Y or Y is better than W. Otherwise, we have a violation of negative transitivity. It is a generalization of this very condition saying that if I have X is better than Y and Y is better than Z, then for any W, I have to have either X is more preferable than W or W is better than Z. And then, so there were, start, yes, please. Yeah, just one quick clarification. The, the, in the first line, so do we assign the, the whole interval to the X or a one particular number between that interval to X? No, no, no. We, we assign total interval. For instance, total interval. Okay. In, my, in my evaluation, I say for me, X is between 80 and 95. But we don't know that. Somewhere, yes, but Somewhere. we don't know. We know nothing. Uh, you see, mm -hmm. there are many other models in which we prescribe, for instance, uh, some probability value, you see, or uh, uh, this uh, fuzzy uh, uh, models, you see, no. Here we don't, we know nothing about where the real value is. Okay. Uh, it is, it is in between u of x and u of x plus epsilon, yeah. In the semi-transitivity condition, uh, is y indifferent to w? Uh, sorry, uh, why why uh, it is in this condition? Well, you will see a bit later uh, how it works. So uh, we are saying there there exists a W which has to be no 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 for any four alternatives x y z w if x is better than y y is better than z then for this very w it should be either x is better than w or w is better than z. okay and uh, this is uh, always for all alternatives yes oops what i did yeah now look here the relation p, p, p is called a semi-order if it satisfies irreflexivity, strong intervality, and semi-transitivity. So these three, uh, two conditions plus irreflexivity, which, which is natural thing. And you can immediately derive from these properties with irreflexivity, as then semi-order is transitive relation, okay? Uh, this was considered and introduced by uh, Deuce. This very model in which epsilon depends on uh, epsilon depends on the alternative itself. This is this is really very crucial uh, changing in the paradigm. You see, epsilon depends on the alternative which we consider. <clears throat> Then it was introduced the concept of interval, the notion of interval order, which satisfies irreflexivity and strong intervality. <coughs> Oops, <coughs> sorry. And uh, finally, epsilon is depends on epsilon uh, depends on x, but it is not restricted by 
this non-negativity, then this very relation which satisfies strong intervality is called the B order. This is a bit strange concept, but there is a <clears throat> alternative understanding of this. Why it is strange? Because if here epsilon is negative, then you understand that right border of interval, right boundary of the interval is placed to the left of the left boundary, you see, which is a bit strange, but still we can consider this kind of uh, relations. And we have a theorem. <clears throat> Again, I would like to remind you this very <clears throat> uh, equivalency, XPY is uh, equivalent uh, if and only if u of x minus u of y is greater than this threshold value, this insensitivity of comparison. Okay, then uh, it first result was proved by Norbert Wiener in 1914 that P is, P is representable as one with this kind of epsilon if and only if P is an interval order. In 1956, Lewis uh, <clears throat> proved, uh, let me tell you one thing, it is very important. Lewis did not know about this work, you see. Uh, I have in my office uh, this very article by Norbert Wiener, and I did in this very field a lot, you see. I, you will see my results later. Uh, when I found this work by Wiener, you see, I spent maybe whole day trying to understand this very result, which I gave. Uh, before that, I gave students many times, you see, but completely the concept of the proof, the concept of presentation is completely different, you see. For us to read this very article of 1914, it is enormously difficult. And so this very work was forgotten by Wiener. Lewis rediscovered this result uh, independently. You see, he did not consider this. Then a bit later, uh, Fishburne uh, wrote an article, rediscovered this. And then uh, in 1974, as far as I remember, Fishburn and Monjardet, they found this very work by Wiener. Wiener, as I told you, Wiener wrote three articles on this topic. And it was, uh, article is called uh, On the Impact of Norbert Wiener to the Theory of, uh, I don't remember. And then it was uh, uh, rediscovered his impact to this very field of Norbert Wiener's field. Uh, in fact, let me tell you that this proof of for semi-orders, these theorems is much more difficult even in modern terms than this proof for interval orders. And in uh, 1969, Ducamp and Falman uh, proved that if it is not uh, restricted by non-negativity, then it is P is a B order, okay? If and only if it is a B order. This is a very fundamental results in uh, this very uh, field. Uh, and uh, there were several articles on this uh, direction uh, and it was, they used very uh, widely in uh, psychology, mathematical psychology, uh, etc. Okay, uh, and now I come to my results in the field. Uh, many of them were not published in the articles, but rather in the books and some uh, uh, surveys uh, which I published in Russian. And there is a book in English uh, with Monjardet, and second edition is with Buissou and Monjardet. Uh, it was published in Springer. Uh, and let me uh, explain you what about this new result. The, uh, the first thing which I 
consider it was the following, you see. Suppose my epsilon depends on two comparable alternatives. You understand? If I compare, for instance, and I will give you this very example a bit later, but on the other context, but can you imagine that if I go to buy Mercedes in the shop, I am a rich person. My When I compare two Mercedes, my error function might be rather high. If I go to buy a small car, cheap, very cheap car, my error, my this difference or threshold might be much lower, much more narrow, right? And that was the idea behind this very model. Yeah. And the mathematicians, you see, first thing which what they do, it is to present it in the form of additive function, right? So epsilon of x, y is additive function of delta, uh, of delta, which is error related to each alternative separately, yes. But this is not an interesting result because uh, uh, it gives us classic model of interval order, okay? Uh, and it is very clear to understand we can put here instead of epsilon, epsilon minus delta of x, epsilon plus delta of x, and then we come to the classic statement. But this the second one is much more interesting and there is a story behind it. <laughs> I was in Paris um, in the uh, University of uh, Paris one, and we, uh, it was Sunday and uh, we went to the Montmartre, to Montmartre with my wife. And then when we came back on the corner of Boulevard Clichy, uh, somebody sold uh, peanuts. And it was uh, long ago, uh, some in 1992 maybe, or even before, I don't remember. Uh, there were no euros at that time, where there were francs. And I asked him how much it cost. Uh, he said eight francs. Can you imagine? I don't remember what I bought yesterday, the prices for yesterday, my purchases. This I remember from 1992. Uh, he said eight francs. I said, okay. I took a, a, a lot of coins from my pocket and started to count them eight francs, eight francs, eight francs. Then I took uh, coins from my wife and gave him 40 francs with very small coins. He gave me uh, five packs of peanuts and then throw out all these coins on the Boulevard Clichy, just uh, on the road, you see. I was so surprised, you see, because this this was at that time it was about four or five dollars or maybe even more you see i don't remember exactly but uh naturally this person is not very uh rich person standing there and selling peanuts well but he gave me peanuts and so i didn't tell something next day in the university i told people this story and said that what does this mean they said, well, there are many crazy people in this world, forget about it. I said, okay, but I did not forget and I constructed this very model. My delta depends of the U of X in power beta with coefficient alpha, alpha is greater than zero. But what does this mean? If beta is positive, this means that the higher is my uh, wells, let's say U of X, right? The higher is my threshold of recognizing these things, okay? Did you get the point? The more rich I am, then for me this threshold, I'm a billionaire, one, two millions here and there, it doesn't matter. So what is the threshold? This very delta, this, where is it? Yeah, this very thing, you see, 
this is the threshold. So I can recognize u of x minus u of y. I can say that x is better than y if this difference u of x minus u of y is greater than this error, or I call I prefer to say it threshold, but it, you can say error. You okay. understand? Error of recognition. And this very formula gives us another understanding that you see if my threshold depends on the u of x of my wells the and beta is positive then the more i'm uh, uh, rich uh, the more rich I, I am then i have <clears throat> this threshold or error higher i'm a billionaire and million here or million there is not too important for me if beta is negative sorry then it is one divided to u of x and then the richer i am i can i count every cent you see i become more and more uh, greedy you understand it is a different uh, definition or explanation of uh, behavior you understand how i construct this insensitivity of uh, Reference uh, of uh, differences in between alternatives, and we proved with my students at that time that if beta is between zero and one, we get a semi-order. That is, it is exactly uh, another view to this very model of uh, use. You understand? If here epsilon is um, um, is presented in this very form and beta is between zero and one we have again the theorem which gives us semi-order and to my other students proved uh, some years later uh, that if beta is arbitrary then we have this very result that uh, p is interval order okay so it is absolutely different view to this very um, situation to the situation of recognition these errors uh, okay i have go. one question yes please so regarding utility representations in the classical sense like in the previous lecture that you were talking about as opposed to intervals today uh, there is a question of uniqueness of representations as well, right? Yes. So, what are, if any, are the analogous statements here? I mean, uh, briefly. Sorry. Sorry, once again. Like, Sorry. what about uniqueness of representations? Like here, we have alphas and betas. Ah, okay. Like yeah, that is uh, that is a different, a bit different story. Uh, let me tell you in another way. Uh, if I have this very p is an interval order for instance i can construct a series of this very uh, utilities and epsilons this and the previous model but they sh they are restricted by monotonic transformation you see this ordinal uh, utility series in contrast to cardinal utility series uh, it is defined up to monotonic transformations okay so there are not uh, in fact unique representation but rather the whole different set of these but it is not so important in terms of you see let's say um, when you make the psychological experiments then it, do, it, do, it doesn't matter which kind of uh, what kind of, of the um, let's say <clears throat> this monotonic uh, uh, transformations gives you every time a unique p you see which is most important that is the story behind of uniqueness professor okay. uh, yes, please. so so when epsilon is not constant yeah. say for say for example when it is always a positive is okay. it is it correct to 
say that then when we are comparing x and y then we are effectively comparing the minimum values they can take and when epsilon is say always negative then we are comparing the maximum value of the intervals and uh, no when, when epsilon is negative there is another representation uh, i didn't present it here i'm oh. sorry i didn't think about it but this very representation i found in my phd thesis mm -hmm. uh, you can define two functions f and g mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, uh, comparison should be made as follows. You have in your mind, for instance, two functions comparing uh, alternatives, f function and g function, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you say that x, p, y, if and only if, f of x is greater than g of y. Okay, okay, okay. That is a different, uh, because you see, for me, a negative epsilon is a strange thing, you see, then yes. the very idea of interval is destroyed, you see, well, what does it mean negative? Yes, so, uh, so, yeah. so say, say that if we only restrict to epsilon being positive, the Wiener's case, then is it correct to say that we are comparing the minimum values of the interval? No, no. Again, no. See, because, okay. because, because it is... Uh, uh, defined up to monotone transformation. Okay, okay, then we can yes, change. Then I can increase the values of u, for instance. Sure. sure. But usually, you see, if we go in this direction, it is a very correct question. I didn't think about it, that this might be such kind of questions. Thank you very much. It's a very correct question. So, Let I me tell you another thing, how it is defined, you see. In, uh, in one of my very, very first works in science, in eight, it was published in 80. Yes, yes. Yes. I don't mm -hmm. remember. Uh, I did such kind of thing in the uh, commission which evaluates uh, uh, scientific works. I gave them the possibility to define it in terms of intervals. For instance, there were a scale of from one to 10. Mm -hmm. and any person can give the uh, evaluating the work can give the number say between five and eight mm -hmm. between one and uh, two for instance or three okay. something like that and okay. then using these very rules and also uh, i did some theory about approximation uh, uh, i constructed the ranking mm -hmm. the total uh, total um, this very models were published in 86 in automation and remote control and very rare but even now the uh, this work is cited okay so uh, so so just uh, to precisely ask my point again so when epsilon is non constant so it may depend on the alternatives okay but it is always positive uh -huh. then then according to what you said if i understood correctly either we compare the min of alternatives or the max or say the average they all are same ah, okay uh, sorry this is another my uh, i did not understand uh, i didn't do it okay let me no let me go back and hmm. i didn't make this picture uh, but it, it might be worth doing you see that is the story you see if yes, i have yes, this yes. interval for this very x mm -hmm. how can i say that x p y i can say only that the left border for x yes yes of interval is placed on the x on the right of the right border of y you understand the worst possible mm -hmm. evaluation of x is greater than the best possible evaluation of y. That is the story. That is the story of company. So it's a mean to max. But min should be greater than max, right? Yeah. If you you prescribe this meaning of mean at, to the left border of interval, yes, it is exactly the case. But professor, sorry to uh, just interject. Yes, yes, please. Suppose that this say that the interval for ux is 10 to 11. Okay. And interval for y is 9.5 to 
then they are intersected yes with intervals and we have in insensitivity uh, in, in in difference then so, we can we okay. cannot say that x is better than y you understand because the the best uh, the, the um, worst case for x is lower than uh, the best case for y the best evaluation for y right so we cannot say that the, uh, y is better than x or x is better than y. We say that we don't know indifferent. No. Okay. Okay, professor. Okay, let's go further. Uh, I had to make a picture. There. Yeah, it is very important. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a you know, one uh, um, sort of reference here. Uh, which is that, you know, I, there is a recent paper by somebody called Frick, Mira Frick in theoretical economics. I don't know if you're aware of that paper, but what it does is that it makes the error a function of the size of the menu, right? So I can make mistakes in choosing the best alternative by an epsilon, which depends on how big the menu is. Okay, now uh, we will and, uh, come to... We will come to this very idea uh, in, okay, in the I'll next, send you next the... slide, but not the size. Uh, uh, let's look here. And now let's consider the case uh, of, um, I'm sorry, this, uh, you see, I, um, I, I'm really sorry, you see, I made corrections in this very presentation and I lost in my files the, the new presentation. So I will send you a new presentation, okay? Uh, but I will explain. It's not crucial, but still, you see, not very pleasant. Uh, okay, so consider now the case when I go to buy a car, okay? And now what I'm saying is that uh, my error depends on the cars which I see in front of me, you see? And consider the following definition of the, uh, what is it, yes, here. Epsilon, which is half of the highest difference between maximal value and minimal value of alternatives in this very set. Is it clear? So I define epsilon as the function, the function depending on the difference between maximal and minimal values in this very set and divided it upon two. So these are the models of Renault Clio. You see, uh, don't be surprised if you say, and don't tell me that there are no such cars now. You see, I did this example when I wrote a book in 2002, I think, first edition it was, and uh, uh, and I took these prices from the uh, inter, uh, internet, yes. Uh, but now maybe these models are absent or prices are, have been changed. So uh, this is just an example. These are four different uh, cars, models of Renault Clio. And these are prices of that very time, okay? Look here. I define Epsilon uh, in this way, it is 1,450 euros, okay? Then I can construct a binary relation on this, among these four alternatives, just comparing these models in terms of this very comparison when uh, I have this epsilon depending in this very form, okay? U of X is my price, Epsilon is my this very epsilon, okay? And I will get this very relation, okay? R3 is indifferent to R1, is indifferent to R4, R3 is indifferent to R4, and all of them are better than R2, okay? Let's take this out, R2. Just erase it from the from the uh, uh, consideration. Then we have the set of three cars. Uh, I'm sorry, here it should be X2. These are three cars, Renault Clio. 
And uh, if we define this epsilon according to this very well uh, formula, we have epsilon is equal to 600. And we can see that uh, our binary relation before these three alternatives were indifferent with each other, right? Now R3 is better than this two, okay? So this gives us an idea, first of all, let me go uh, ahead and define, and I did it in my works, oh, where is it? Yes, that I can define choice function. Now, change it to zero, this epsilon. We come to the classic choice function, which is rationalized by utility function, right? But now I would like to extend it to put here epsilon, which depends of X capital of my presentation and maybe some other elements. For instance, with comparison of elements inside the set. Or I can construct the parametric family of binary relations, preferences, in this very form, but parametric because it depends on X capital. For different X's, as we saw it here, the binary relation will be different. Is it clear, everything? Yes. Then, then I can come to the idea, uh, this, which forms of threshold we have. Uh, Epsilon might depend on both compared alternatives like before, right? Epsilon might depend only on Y, only on X, and it might not depend on alternatives, just uh, uh, it depends on the set as we saw it in this very example. It turned out it is possible to prove that models A and B are equivalent, these models, and C and D are equivalent, so we have only two models. Okay, and let's study this very models. So we have to, we, we changed again the very paradigm. You see, now we say that in contrast to the previous classic cases, we say that it, it is depend, uh, this very choice, uh, my choice depends on naturally of my comparison of utilities, and this very threshold depends on X capital and other and maybe alternatives in a different way. Let's go further and consider another example. And again, you see this very uh, cars uh, models were taken in 2002 when I wrote a book, uh, and these prices are from that very period. If we consider these four cars with these prices and the same definition of epsilon, we get in construct this binary relation, we get this type of binary relation, M4 and M3 better than M2 and M1 both, okay? Now let us, oops. Uh, erase M1 from here, okay? Again, define this very uh, epsilon in the same way and construct a binary relation. What do we have? We have this binary relation and you can see very in interesting things that you see if I de delete M1 from here, the binary relation is uh, inherited in a sense, or it is the same without M1, the same relations, which was absolutely not the case for Renault, right? And then it leads us to the following very important question, but before that, I would like to present you very important to a couple of theorems. Th theorem one. If epsilon is non-restricted by non-negativity, 
then every choice function is rationalizable in this very form. You see, with epsilon dependent, being dependent on x and y and x capital. So, assume that you follow me and write what kind of choice I make out of these cars or yogurts or whatever, and I can make any kind of stupid choice, you see, non-rational, whatever. Every time you can find uh, this very epsilon, this type of epsilon, and explain my behavior, which is in fact non-interesting, you see. But suppose now epsilon is non-negative, and what, where we come, we come to the idea of fixed point condition. Fixed point condition is very well uh, known from functional analysis. It's a, uh, uh, one of the key concepts in classic mathematics. And I was really very pleased to see that in this very model we come to the fixed point condition and in this very new presentation which I did yesterday and I couldn't find it now I thought that I, it is here no it is not here fixed point condition is the following in every set you have an alternative at one maybe at least one which is chosen in that very set and in all subsets where this alternative is included so it is really fixed point, you understand? Okay, and next theorem tells us, it's a very fundamental theorem. That if epsilon depends only of X capital, it is, possible if and only if weak axiom of revealed preferences holds. Now I would like to go back to the classic uh, theory of uh, Paul Samuelson, which was published in 1938. And one of the fundamental um, results of this very article in 1938 was the following. Suppose we have choice function uh, single value choice functions. This is very important. Uh, and uh, for which weak axiom of revealed preferences hold. Let me explain you in words, you see, because I did it, but couldn't find it. In words, it is the following. Let us construct a binary relation P in the following form. If there is X capital, which means that the set in which X belongs to the choice of this set, Y does not belong, then we put uh, the preference between X and Y. Weak axiom of revealed preferences says that this very P should be acyclic. And Samuelson immediately showed in that very article that single valuedness of choice function and uh, weak axiom of revealed preference is equivalent to the existence of classically rationalizable choice function by utilities, by classic rationality without any epsilon, etc. So choice function represents our uh, maximization of utility. It was Samuelson's fundamental theorem. What it turned out in this very field, where is it? That if we allow choice function to be non-single valued, non-single valued, okay, then weak axiom of revealed preference is necessary and sufficient to such representation with epsilon being dependent of X capital. Okay, is it clear? I'm again sorry that I did not, uh, I don't have this in presentation, but in words, I tried to explain it. If you have questions, please ask. 
so I have one question regarding the yes, point please. you made in the previous slides. In previous uh, slide. I mean, yeah, where you define this max minus min as the uh, epsilon of x1 and all that. Maybe, in the, yeah, maybe in the previous one. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are getting uh, preferences, right? I mean, these arrow diagrams uh, dependent on what is x1 or what is x2. So previously there were no arrows between r1, r3, etc. But now there are. So is it possible to have arrows getting reversed? I mean, is such a thing possible? As you change x1, yeah, as you change x1 to x2, uh, would something like that also be possible that uh, now there is an arrow which is reverse to an arrow which was previously there with some x1? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, but I didn't consider it. I don't know. It, it will depend on the form of the epsilon. Uh, I'm not sure almost uh, in some general considerations uh, I'm not sure that in this form of epsilon, it is possible. Maybe not. But in other forms of epsilon, yes, it is possible. And do you think that that is kind of uh, essential? I mean, I, I mean, would it be a good idea to have consistency that arrows are not reversed when you change the context? Uh, that's a good point, but I will come to a similar point a bit later. Okay, thank you. Some other questions? No? So I would like to emphasize two things which I am really very uh, like very much. You see, these are my theorems and uh, this weak axiom of revealed preferences, very classic thing. It turned out that which gives us a rationalizability by utilities in the case of single value choice functions, in multi-value choice function, the same thing gives us Epsilon depends on epsilon of x cap. Okay, and now I go to the next story. Next story was the following. Again, it was published in the book in 1995, in Russian even before, and it was published also at the beginning of 2002, I mean, maybe, in my big article on automation and remote control. Uh, you see, uh, at the uh, beginning of 1950s, another very famous scientist, uh, Herbert Simon, criticized enormously classic choice theory, saying that, <coughs> sorry, uh, saying that uh, people never choose what is the, our idea of choice uh, in classic uh, circumstances that we have to compare each alternative to the other alternative, look which is the best, compare the best one with the third alternative, fourth alternative, etc. right? It is pairwise comparison. And as I uh, told you in the previous lecture, it came uh, from this uh, Condorcet uh, principle it was discussed from the uh, beginning of the century. And in fact, the very idea of this very pairwise comparison goes back to Condorcet at the end of 18th century. Okay. And Herbert Simon was uh, crit uh, criticized uh, this very idea and said that people never choose by pairwise comparison of alternatives and suggested another idea in which he said that there is a so-called uh, satisfying level of each uh, for each person and everything which is above his or her satisfying level, uh, people choose. Otherwise they don't, they reject it, okay? So the, uh, he formulated, uh, I don't remember exactly how it is called in, in, in English. I think it's Models of Man, Herbert Simon's very famous book, and it is really very nice. I would suggest uh, students who did not read it to read it because it is a really great book. Um, so it was published in English as far as I remember in 1956. 
And in our uh, book, when we start, uh, write this book, I formalized this very story uh, accurately in mathematical terms. Uh, and the idea is the following. Yes, we have this last function, which gives the to any subset of A, gives the value in R plus, okay? And we choose C of X, we choose those Y's for which utility of Y is greater or equal, sorry, here should be X capital. X capital uh, and um, this is the last or satisfying level, you see. I come to the shop, I see the set of yogurts. I need a yogurt with fatness, let's say 2.5 and above, and everything which is there with 2.5 and above is okay for me. Or maybe below, for instance, uh, below 2.5 i would do like to have uh, some kind of non-fat yogurts but everything is good for me you understand in in the book it was uh, made uh, it was proved a theorem when this very choice function is reducible to classic choice function but then I proved the following theorem this very representation this satisfying choice is equivalent to our representation to this one with epsilon de being dependent of x capital okay and now we will come to this a bit later to the application of this very idea it turned out it is very very uh, efficient idea in some problems uh, but how we can define this satisfying level? There are many, many different ways to do it. For instance, it might be L1 is average utility value on this very set. You see, we have average value on this very set and everything above this average value is okay for me or we can define it in that way or even to fix it for instance some for some key as i told you for this yogurt 2.5 and below for instance that is good for me okay is it clear and important thing to, it turned out that this very classic idea of satisfying choice is equivalent to this very uh, our idea of uh, representation of this very choice in terms of this threshold insensitivity error function, etc. So, would it be fair to say that warp is equivalent to satisfaction? Sorry, uh, once again, uh, I didn't get the, the question. <clears throat> so, is it fair to say that warp, the condition, uh, weak axiom, of yes. preference that Absolutely. is equivalent to satisfying yes. yeah yes, that, that is yeah that is a, uh, how can i say uh, a pure uh, 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 consequence from these two theorems six and five uh, six and seven yeah, but this was not already proved by herbert simon is it or uh, i mean no 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 no, no, no. He discuss, no, he did, he did discuss it with just general uh, philosophical uh, He didn't make okay. mass. Okay. At least I don't know. Maybe he did, but it, I did not uh, see this. With, uh, Thank you. Proof, yeah. Okay, and then we come back to this very idea. You remember? I told about the um, um, set parametric uh, system of binary relations, yes, in which my binary relation depends of 
X capital, right? And I would like now to state the following problem, which goes to very classic problems. You see, in classic choice theory, which was stated by uh, people like Samuel Smith, uh, et cetera, uh, what do we have? We have that in our choice of different sets, these preferences are always the same. You see, there, in fact, there is a big binary uh, relation defined from on the whole set A. And when we consider subsets, we always consider contraction of this subsets, uh, of this binary relation to these subsets. This kind of situation is impossible in classic choice theory. You understand? If I consider this set R1, R2, R3, R4, if I then contra uh, uh, make the set more narrow, for instance, R1, R3, R4, then it should be like this, you see, it should not change the preference. Is it clear? This is a very fundamental assumption of classic choice theory. And then uh, it is like in this Mercedes uh, example, you see, here we did not change. In fact, we take out M1 and the preference hasn't been changed. Okay, so, and the same idea I stated here in this very model, saying that I consider this parametric system of a set of preferences, but this every element of this set, there is a general set P, and every time Px is a contraction of P to uh, the Cartesian pro product to X to X. You understand that it, um, it uh, inherited this very idea, uh, uh, not idea, the preferences over subsets, like in Mercedes case, not like in the Renault case, okay? And answer was given with me and my PhD student, uh, at that time, Rafik Agaev. And answer was the following. Characterization, we call it weak by orders. And you remember in classic interval um, um, order, if we have these two preferences, we have to have these preferences, okay? Now we have a bit more. If we have these two preferences, we have one of the red lines. Uh, here, in fact, it might be one of them from here to here or opposite. Or we can have here also um, reflexive pairs, okay? And this is one condition, so it is a some kind of uh, related, uh, that's why I call this weak intervality condition. And if we have cycle of any lens, we have to have something which destroys this pu pureness, let's say, of cycle. Something like a reflexive pair like this, or the pair like this. Okay, this is a characterization of binary relation which satisfies this very condition. And it is called weak by order. And full characterization was given, uh, I don't remember exactly the year, uh, the beginning of 90s, I think. Uh, in mathematical social science, this work was published. Okay, is it, is it clear what uh, the problem itself and uh, the solution? Yes. yes. Is it yes. something between transitivity and acyclicity? I mean the latter diagram? No, it is not. It is, you see, I, um, I interpret it in the following sense, okay? That uh, 
it is some kind you see we destroy this very if i have a pure cycle a uh, a better than b better than c better than a i have to have something it's one of this not exact which destroys this pure cycle either a is better than itself or uh, b to c then we have to have c to b okay no, but in terms of, I mean, a person deciding between three alternatives, what does this mean? I don't know. You see, this means that only we should not have a pure cycle, you see. Again, here, epsilon of x might be also negative. That's why we have this kind of specific cases. Okay. This is the story, and then I've switched to another uh, model, which also is very interesting. Uh, now I would like to consider, again, you see, I have this epsilon of X is um, the error, which is defined by the set itself, right? But I would like this epsilon to be an additive function of deltas, which are defined by on the alternatives and it, they are non-negative, okay? And again, I would like to, this is very important part of the story, that my this very parametric family of preferences be defined like this, but my parametric family is always a contraction of some general P to my axis, like in this Mercedes cases. What kind of P might be represented in this very form? The answer to this question, it is very hard theorem, but it was proved. It is presented in this very book uh, with Monjardin and uh, Buissou. And it was published in a very famous Russian mathematics journal where all famous mathematicians uh, like Kolmogorov and other people publish their articles. It's called uh, reports or Daklade of Academy of Science, Reports of Academy of Science, Mathematics Series. It was published there and uh, the answer was really very impressive, even for me. Uh, the answer was the following, you see. For any two alternatives which are preferable, right, there is not more then one alternative, which are one alternative, which is indifferent between these two. You understand? This is uh, this defines so-called simplest semi-orders, and the complete characterization, everything is in the book. But the very idea, you remember, that in the classic case, we, uh, uh, um, if you remember this very. Uh, example with bicycle and pony at horse, uh, it was forbidden in classic models because uh, it does not uh, satisfy this uh, negative transitivity condition. Here we say the following, it is possible to violate this condition, but only by one alternative of such kind, not more than one between every two alternatives which are preferable to each other and the same thing which when we have a weak order and we destroy it in a sense uh, or generalize it by including not more than one alternative which is indifferent between all these two and one alternative between these two not more than one I call them simple semi-order. This is simplest. We have only one alternative in each class. Here there might be many alternatives in this class. And then uh, 
And this is the simple and simplest semi-order explaining. And uh, this very story, additivity defines uh, or gives us this very, very specific idea of uh, destroying, let's say, a classic utility model in terms of negative transitivity. Okay? Is it clear, everything? Yes. Good. And then there is another characterization of this very, uh, of this very model, uh, of this very, uh, sorry, uh, binary relation, simple and simplest semi-order, which I called contours diversity condition for any two alternatives. X and Y, there should not be the case when uh, lower and upper contours uh, coincide, you see. So both of them should be different. Okay. If we apply this very condition to partial orders, this will give us linear order. But we can. Uh, make this condition weaker and say that only one of them should not coincide. Then we come to simple semi-orders or uh, from simple semi-orders applying this, we come to simple semi-orders and this is exactly violation of negative transitivity, but we have a full characterization of this very story, okay? And now, if it is clear, then I go to the general picture. Uh, I'm sorry, it is handwritten. Uh, it is uh, what we know now. Uh, these are linear orders which were introduced by Cantor and Pierce uh, in 1880 and 1890. And this is epsilon is equal to zero and u of x is not equal to u of y for any. Here are simple semi-orders. Here are weak orders, again, Schroeder and Cantor. Simple semi-orders with additive x, epsilon, etc. We go here, semi-orders introduced by Deuce, interval orders by Wiener, Mirkin and Fishburn, Pierce, studied partial orders and we go here b orders and uh, connected b orders and here are weak b orders and acyclic weak b orders which were studied by my phd student at that time rafik agaev and me so we have this very picture very interesting picture uh, and uh, this is um, Oh, sorry, uh, let me go further. Uh, no, I didn't do it, sorry. Uh, just one story about this. Uh, when I wrote this very article con uh, concerning this very representation and this simple and simple semi-orders in this very famous journal, mathematical journal, uh, the reviewers, there are three reviews are, uh, is a read and is very famous mathematicians write review in this uh, journal. Um, and uh, all three reviews were positive. And in one review, uh, the reviewer wrote that uh, um, it will be better if you give as an example where it can be used. And uh, I remind a very interesting story about uh, Benzer's work on genetics. In genetics, uh, this very uh, interval orders, uh, the, uh, if we consider indifference relation for interval order, uh, do we have time? I can switch to uh, to maybe another presentation 
just to give, or, or maybe, okay, well, I will go because I have something to tell about. Uh, okay, uh, just a few words. And it turned out that, you see, I will not go too much in genetics, you see, and for me, it is very interesting thing because, you see, it shows how all science is related, you see. Uh, this very model gives us the simplest possible organism, biological organism, which allows mutations. And it is a mathematical theorem, you see. Because of this very uh, Benzer's works of the uh, linear uh, representation of gene, uh, this very thing, I don't know whether there exists such uh, real, in reality, such organisms or not, but if there exist, they cannot be simpler than this very representation. It is the simplest and it is a mathematical theorem. And it is, it is uh, the simplest uh, organism which allows mutation. And when I published this very article, uh, when it was published, just two weeks later, uh, I got an invitation, maybe one month later, I got an invitation to come and give a plenary talk on genetic congress in the United States. I rejected because I'm not, I, I cannot consider myself as a person who can give plenary talks on genetics conferences. <laughs> okay. But it is a mathematical theorem, you see. And now I would like to go to another direction also, which is very interesting again. Uh, it is idea of superposition of choice procedures. Again, the very idea and the first results were obtained by Eiserman and Maryshevsky. I extended very much this very results in our book with Eiserman. So we have now, uh, uh, we published a whole chapter. And in fact, it, it came from the, uh, if you know, the, at the beginning of 20th century, uh, Hilbert, David Hilbert, which was the greatest mathematician of the time, stated 23 mathematical unsolved mathematical problems which really influenced the development of math in 20th century enormously and this was a 13th hilbert problem i will just give a simpler understanding of it the problem was the following that if we have real valued function and we use them one after another, sometimes it's called composition of, uh, of functions. We apply first function and the result we put as a uh, uh, x as, as a uh, variable for the second function, yes? What kind of good properties we might obtain from this superposition? And uh, answer was given by Kolmogorov and Arnold. Uh, in uh, here in 1956, I got lectures from Kolmogorov and lectures Arnold gave us gave us uh, lectures on differential equations, and I studied this problem. You see, so answer was negative. The results are not good, and there are many many problems. Uh, okay, and when we wrote a book with Eiserman, uh, they did some work in <clears throat> with Maryshevsky, but I uh, uh, extended it because you see, I had to find an answer. Maybe we will have something better in terms of choice functions, to use choice functions sequentially. So what is the problem statement that- I will, I will uh, come, I will, I will come to this. And next attempt was made in 2008 by my PhD student, Yetkin Chinar and myself, and it was published in the Syrian decision. And that is the idea. We have initial criteria or utility functions. We have rationalized by these utilities choice functions, and we consider superposition of choice function. 
we take uh, x capital for the first function, then the result used for the second one, third one, etc. Okay, that is the very idea. And the question was, to which extent some good properties, if they possess some good properties, this function will possess these good properties, okay? Uh, for instance, uh, let me, uh, you remember in the previous lecture, we consider heredity, concordance, etc. If all these functions possess heredity, will this function possess heredity or not? Answer is in general was negative. You see, in very rare cases for very specific cases, they possess good, good properties. Okay. But we can consider only two-step mechanism and uh, consider that we have this X, we put it into the first choice function, get an output, the choice. This choice is uh, given to the second choice function. This is a final choice. And we can consider different types of mechanisms. These are my uh, properties. And for instance, if in the first <clears throat> in the first uh, step we use maximin procedure and at the next step we use border procedure and none of them satisfy or, or the result does not satisfy these good conditions but if we use in a different way we satisfy monotonicity but not these classic conditions okay and then we did the following, you see, <clears throat> and uh, this very problem came from very interesting problem of search in the uh, big data set. It was enormous, the huge data set. And the idea was how to use, how to make a search in this very data set. And I suggested, uh, we, we had this uh, very important, um, very uh, big project with one uh, Western German firm. And it was a huge, huge data set. And I suggested to use this very superposition because you see classic models worked very slow, very enormously slow. And I suggested to use uh, the um, sequential, this superposition, and in each uh, step, used to this uh, that very threshold rule, which we discussed uh, concerning this uh, Herbert Simon's idea of satisfying choice. Okay, so in each step here, I use um satisfying rule get the result use here satisfying rule get the result it turned out i will not be too uh, um, i will not go into details it works enormously fast because it's a linear you see by complexity and then we applied this, uh, there is a Microsoft database with 1,175,000 documents with 136 factors. And uh, we use this, I call it super threshold, but it's a this satisfying procedure. Uh, we used this very data and compare it with support vector machine and we got oh, you see the difference with classic method of support vector machine gives about 50 percent of accuracy our method gives us 84 percent of accuracy 84 and we applied for patent in russia in uh, america and after a few years, we got these patents from United from the United States, and uh, Russia we got it uh, rather fast. But for from the United States, it took some years. 
<clears throat> and then it is very recent work. It was published last year in uh, in um, Springer Nature Computer Science. We uh, put um, we apply this data, this, this very method to tornado prediction in the United States. It was absolutely accidental. I gave a plenary talk in uh, in Greece, in some international conference in Greece. And after me, the, one of the colleagues presented the, uh, uh, their results concerning tornado prediction. And uh, the results were not very good. And I told him that we have this method why not to use to your data? He said, why not? And we decided to do it and we do, did it. So we had this input data of 83 parameters, yes. And the prediction of mesocyclone, I will not go too in details. Uh, we compare it with different methods and we selected this very special uh, type of uh, special parameters and this uh, let me go to the end classic results gave the best result was 57 percent of correct predictions 57 our result was 61 percent of um, correct predictions. In fact, you see, you should look here because, okay, let's go here. You see, this is so called critical success index because it also uh, includes uh, here, you see, we have uh, true tornado prediction and false tornado, non-tornado prediction. And we have here also um, false tornado forecast. So we have 61%. And I can say that in this very field, every 0.5% uh, of improving cons is considered a great result. So we have 4% by using this method. So here I would like to stop uh, because in fact, I finished everything. Uh, it was great pleasure for me to give this lecture. If you have questions, I will be happy to answer. Uh, could you explain that from where did this uh, prediction... Uh, so, you know, you were talking throughout about uh, choice functions, right? Choice functions, yes. procedures. Yes. From that, this jump to prediction, I did not get the connection. Oh, well, you, you know, the, the Oscar Mayer, the uh, father of thermodynamics, he has, I, I don't know very too many quotations, but this I remember and uh, use very often. Um, uh, Oscar Mayer said that there is nothing more practical than a good theory, which I like very much. And it is correct. So uh, the idea is the following. You see, we have many parameters, right? Uh, which gives us the uh, parameters in the different places of tornado, um, uh, where tornado arises, right? And then we analyzing these all parameters, we have to forecast which, uh, let's say, composition of parameters uh, lead to tornado, leads to tornado or not. You understand? Okay. Then we, we do the following. You see, we take, uh, for instance, this very V21 is the number of parameter, V56, uh, 59 is number of parameter. We construct a choice function, for instance, on the basis of um, uh, these parameters using this uh, uh, over threshold choice, this satisfying choice, okay? 
put the result into the next, into the next, into the next, and come to the result that this very composition of parameters will give us a tornado, okay? It is exactly the problem of choice. And we get this accuracy of 61%. And for that, the definition of these choice functions, the intermediate choice functions which you are composing, uh, how are you or, coming to that? I mean, these or, are satisfying principles, but what are they exactly? Satisfying? Yeah, but uh, our... They're, they're each satisfying principles, right? No, no, look here. Uh, we have this, uh, util let's say utility, the higher, the more, uh, uh, for instance, if it is pressure, the higher is pressure, the uh, more, uh, the more um, is probably, the higher is the probability that tornado uh, will happen, okay? Yes, yes. So we have, uh, I don't remember, 38 or 40,000, uh, points of uh, where they took this uh, data, okay? So what we do, we first separate the points with high pressure, for instance, by this satisfying principle. Then humidity comes, for instance, okay? Then we take these chosen alternatives, put it into the humidity part. After humidity, some kind other of other parameters, and go in this very way. Here you can see uh, seven parameters uh, only used because you see it turned out that it is enough to predict tornado, not on all 83. But it was published recently in the Springer Nature Computer Science, and if you wish, I can send you an article with all details. Okay, thank you. And uh, and so, could you actually have uh, linear combinations of these factors as we find in principal component analysis uh, in order to define each step? Like, as yeah. you said, humidity is one and then pressure is one. But could you have, you know, principal components which are convex yeah. combinations? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I, I never used principal, uh, I, well, I, once I used principal component analysis because of the following, you see. In principal component analysis, it is, it is very difficult to inter interpret the com uh, combined uh, criteria, uh, you see, combined uh, parameters. Uh, the, uh, in some cases, it is very easy to interpret. Then I used it maybe one or two times in my life. In many other cases, it is uh, non-interpretable, and then I didn't use it. So I, I do like to understand what I am doing, and that is why we use this kind of uh, things. For instance, in support vector machine, in this kind of cluster analysis techniques, you can interpret everything. Yes. In this superposition principle, you can interpret everything, but not in principal component analysis. I don't like it very much. This is a very powerful instrument, but when you can interpret the result, you see these uh, components. If not, then uh, there are serious problems. What is it? Uh, can I, oh, sorry. Yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, since we are on this topic, how is it different from normal decision trees that are already used in uh, prediction? So uh, it, well, it seems I like that. Uh, as I told you, normal decision theory, which was used, is for instance, support vector machine, logistic reg regression, etc., gave gave uh, us uh, this kind of accuracy. We got accuracy sixty one percent. So that is the story, you see. No, I don't say that uh, my method is the best in the world. Naturally, it, 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 is, uh, it might uh, be uh, different in different cases, but at least in uh, two or three applications which we did, we, get, we got very good results. So the question is that uh, theoretically they look the same, like the random forest or say a single decision tree. This is a single decision tree as I see. So uh, you have thresholds at each level and then 
if you come down the node according to the satisfaction of the threshold right yes so so Every, this is exactly what decision trees do right no already no no decision tree uh, how it works it goes to the branches with respect to some uh, criteria right but we yes. take we, but we take uh, all subset of alternatives which satisfy uh, this um, um, uh, this uh, you, you understand that this very idea of uh, uh, how to define the threshold satisfaction yeah. level that is the parameter which we can construct here uh, professor just your views on a say Suppose if I, yeah, so suppose if I think of a case where say that each alternative is assigned some interval, uh -huh. the length of interval uh, may depend on the alternative itself. Now I am comparing the midpoint of each interval and yes. say that I'll say that if the, the difference of average exceeds delta, then I'll choose the alternative accordingly. Uh -huh. So this kind of choice procedure, does it uh, covered somewhere in your, the models you have presented in a general or is it uh, something? Uh, no, but if you take an average point in this yes. mean point in each interval, you just reduce the problem to the classic problem of comparison of utilities. Yes, and that's all. Uh, there are many, many ways how to compare these intervals. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, compare by the, uh, well, the general idea is to somehow to prescribe some probabilities, for instance. Okay. You if you have this, then you can by mean value or expected value to say mm -hmm. that, okay, for X, it is 0 0.2, for Y, it is 0 0.5, and then compare them, right? True, yes. But uh, if you don't have this probability or fuzzy set approach, then there are many ways. For instance, in uh, some years ago, in 94, I think, I uh, wrote an article, it was published in Information Sciences, concerning multi-criteria models with these very intervals. Okay, mm. and uh, I did not consider this very re uh, reducing to classic models, but rather suggested different ways how to compare these intervals. And then uh, it was published here. And even now we have some, I have some references to that. Okay, thank you, Professor. My pleasure. Okay, some and other questions. What about and what about the irreversibility of the arrows question I was asking? Uh, like, you know, when you were doing this reduction using epsilon's context dependent, x1, x2, uh, in a new context, uh, arrows don't get reversed. Uh, do you have something more to say on that? Uh, I didn't get your question, in fact, you see. Uh, sorry for this. <clears throat> Can you explain me reversing uh, arrows? Ah, you mean in that very case? Uh, ah, okay. In the Renault example that you were giving us. Two drivers. In this very case, uh, you mean reversing arrow? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, uh, this we did not uh, investigate very carefully. You see, I told you about. Uh, more general from my point of view problem, where is it? Uh, the yeah, restriction. The, yeah, the restriction is that it should be the same. There is a one P and all these uh, parametric preferences are uh, con contraction of P to subsets, okay? This is some kind of, uh, but I didn't think even about in which cases it will be the uh, inverse or not inverse. Maybe it is worth uh, studying. I don't know. Okay, Fuad, um, thank you very much. Um, 
you know, very interesting uh, talks, many things to think about. Uh, just two things. Uh, for one, I mean, if you uh, send us uh, the, the slides or the, uh, the, your presentation, uh, perhaps the one that you, uh, the, the one that you, uh, your corrected ones, uh, if you send it to me or Devashish, that will be great. I mean, some people may want to take a look at it. Um, uh, I will do it, certainly. And, and secondly, uh, you know, perhaps some, whenever you're free, maybe in November, we will write and have a, a lecture or two on social choice. Uh, is that okay? Yes, it will be pleasure. I will give, uh, it will be pleasure to give two lectures on social choice. Uh, 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 one in general ideas of um, arrow type uh, studies. Uh, another one might be about manipulation and some other kind you see, for instance, this algebraic representation of choice rules. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. Might, might be, yeah. Uh, uh, again, I will not go into mathematic details, but still you see it will contain... I mean, you are welcome to do so. I mean, you can, if you want, you can give the mathematical details as well. I mean, many of these people will know at least the, you know, arrow uh -huh. theorem and so on, yeah. I don't know. When, I, when we, with Eiserman, we wrote the first article on social choice, I brought him as a text in a pure algebraic terms, absolute algebraic article. Yeah. He read it and said, what? What do you wish for your article to read 500 people or two? I said, naturally 500. Okay. He said, then in this form, it is impossible. This is only for, for two people in the world. <laughs> so okay. that is the story. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very so much. Thank again. you very much again, Fuad. Yeah. And we shall see each other soon online. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I, I just okay. want to add to everyone that uh, the seminar video and the slides will be available on the ISI uh, seminar website. So... Once Fuad sends the slide, I'll put the video as well as the seminar on the website. Devashis, I will try to do it uh, today. I will find yeah, it yeah. because I did it and I lost, I don't know where is it. I, I hope uh, in half an hour, in one hour, I will find this very presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that is, yeah. Bye, take care. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Take care and be healthy and safe.